Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings. Thanks for joining this worship service and sharing in this time together. I pray that God blesses our time together uh, during this day. I'm Jeff Ross. I'm one of the pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Our scripture for today is found in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 35 to 43. And it says, while he was still speaking, speaking of Jesus, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion and people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then they put them all outside and took the child's father and mother back to where the girl was. And they went in to where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. And Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this. And he told them to give the girl something to eat. May God add his blessing to our hearing and reading and understanding of his word. Wow, there are those words again. Don't be afraid. You know, that's so much easier said than done. Last week we looked at the story of Jesus on the water and the waves crashing over the boat in the storm. And he said to the disciples, don't be afraid. Well, again... Uh, sometimes life is difficult and things are scary and it's hard not to be afraid. You know, one of the things I enjoy about preaching and, and sharing the, the gospel and the word of God is the study behind it. I enjoy reading and researching and looking and uh, listening to uh, people from all different ages talk about the passage and what it means and what it meant to them and, and the things they see in it and, and maybe things that I missed. Uh, I like the, the process of looking and listening historically and traditionally at what others have said. But I also like listening with a, a current ear, a modern ear, uh, uh, and for the congregation uh, that the sermon will be delivered to. What is Jesus trying to say to you and me? What is the Word of God sharing with us that in this day, in this time, with all the things going on around us, uh, how is the Scripture speaking into our lives? So I enjoy the discovery. So one of the things I discovered this, this past week is a thing called the 365 Days 
uh, of fear not. Uh, and evidently, it's a, it's a big thing on the internet and on places like Pinterest, uh, where you see this posted, uh, and they, they try to direct you to a, a place where there's 365 days worth of fear nots. And that's helpful, uh, because that 365 days means there's one for every day of the year. Uh, isn't that great? Uh, because uh, we all struggle with being afraid. And so if there was something to help us overcome those fears on a daily basis, that'd be great, right? Well, actually, that would be great, but it's actually not true. There are not 365 uh, passages in the Bible that use the words fear not or don't be afraid. Uh, in fact, there's, there's more like 150, but 365 sounds good, doesn't it? It, it gives people hope and it's something to share, but it, it, it kind of illustrates part of the problem I want us to look at today is that how people profit from fear. They'll, they'll take something and they'll get all excited and then uh, it's not quite the way that it was portrayed or, or looked at. Uh, they, they pull the rug out from under you, if you will. One of the other things I discovered was uh, a list of the top 25 industries that profit from fear. Um, you might wonder what that list looks like. You can Google it. I'll give you the top three. Politicians, insurance, and sadly, religion. Um, as we look this morning, that's going to kind of go against what Jesus is telling us to do. But fear is big business. If we can get folks to be afraid of something, then they'll buy our product. Uh, if we can offer something that will alleviate fear, uh, then people might pay a whole lot of money for that. And, and folks have discovered that over uh, the years. There's a, a, an acronym, F-U-D, uh, and it stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's a propaganda tactic that is taught uh, to salespeople, marketing people, public relations people, politicians, uh, polling folks, and, and is used in cults. FUD, as it's called, is used as a strategy to influence uh, perception by disseminating negative or false information uh, and is an appeal to prey on people's fears. Stock market strategists have known this for years, and they encourage people to buy the fear. Uh, when fear uh, grabs hold of an industry or a market and stock prices go down, uh, they say to buy that fear, believing that the prices will eventually go back up. Profiting from fear, you know, it isn't anything new. Uh, even in the, in the Old Testament and New Testament, especially in this passage that we're going to look at today, uh, people are profiting from fear, and Jesus is working overtime to try to keep Jairus from falling into that. So let's take a look back at the passage. We're first introduced to Jairus back in verse 22 of this fifth chapter. He comes to Jesus because his daughter is sick. Uh, and he actually falls on his knees and he begs Jesus to come and heal her. Which is really fascinating because if, if you noticed in the passage, it said the leader of the synagogue, leader of the synagogue, leader of the synagogue, three or four times it, it makes us aware that this was a leader of the synagogue that has come to Jesus to ask for his help. And that's noteworthy because at the time, Jesus and the, the, the synagogue leaders were clashing. They weren't getting along. The synagogue leaders wanted Jesus to be quiet and go away. Uh, Jesus was interfering with their business. He was hurting prophets. Uh, and so for Jairus to come to Jesus, it's interesting, when his daughter is sick and things of importance are on the line, he turns to Jesus and not his fellow synagogue leaders. But he comes to Jesus and begs Jesus to help him. And so when we pick it back up in verse 35, that's when Jairus and Jesus receive the news that the daughter has passed away. And that's where Jesus goes into action. He turns to Jairus and he can see all of the life draining out of his faith. And he, and he says to Jairus, don't be afraid. Gosh, that's a... That's a really tough pill to swallow, right? Um, 
Uh, sometimes when we're told not to be afraid, the, the thing we're afraid of is kind of small and we can muster up the courage. But when it's our 12-year-old daughter and we've just been told that she's died, that's really a tough, tough uh, situation to put Jairus in. But Jesus knows that he had to exhibit a lot of faith to even come to Jesus uh, back in verse 22 and beg him to come and heal his daughter. So he doesn't want to lose that. He doesn't want uh, Jairus' faith to, to, to flitter away because of this news. Even with this bad news, Jesus wants Jairus to still hope for the best, to still have faith, to still not succumb to the fear that would, would grip most of us. And so he turns to Jairus and he says, don't be afraid. Only believe. Continue to believe. Don't let up. And so the two of them and Peter and James and John walk to the house. As they get to the house, they, they hear and see lots of commotion. And that's where in Jesus' day, people were profiting from fear. Uh, some of the whalers and musicians and weepers were there because they were friends and relatives. Others were there because they were getting paid. Uh, others were there as sort of a tryout. If I wail louder than everybody else, I might get paid to be a whaler. I, I might be a paid mourner. Uh, I could make some money off of this. I could profit from this. And so Jesus says, what's all the commotion? And they say, the little girl is dead. And Jesus says, no, she's not dead. She's only asleep. And, and so the response of the people when Jesus announces this is to laugh. Because it's so much easier to believe the fear than it is the hope. It's so much easier to, to go down the road of fear and danger and dismay and discouragement and anger and bitterness than, than it is to turn the page and, and look for a silver lining or look for hope or, or look for something redeemable. So which is easier in your life? Do you find yourself succumbing to the fear because uh, there's fear all around us. Like I said, there's, uh, fear is big business. And we see it in commercials, social media, all around us. People are trying to scare us into buying a product or to doing something or changing our lifestyle because we're afraid. Do we give in to that? Do we succumb to that? Or do you live your life out in a, in a, in a, in a life of faith and of, and of hope? Well, that's the battleground that, that we find ourselves on here, that Jesus is, is fighting with Jairus uh, to help him stay above the fray of the fear. Well, this hit my house really hard a, a few years ago, this whole battle between faith and fear. Uh, our middle daughter, Amy, was working in a retail store. And part of her responsibilities every once in a while was to get the bank bag after it had been uh, checked by the manager and, and uh, uh, sealed and take it to the bank and put it in the night uh, drop. And so on this particular occasion, she did that. She did it by herself, which was, again, the store policy. She got in her car, took the bank bag, uh, took it to the bank and put it in the night deposit uh, and drove away. She didn't get a receipt. That was just, again, part of the policy. And, um, uh, and she'd done this a number of times. Uh, when she got to work the next day, they said, uh, did you not get a chance to go by the bank? Can, can you give it to me and, and somebody will take it now? And she said, no, I put it in the bank. And the manager said, well, the bank didn't get it. It's not there. And Amy said, well, I took it. And so uh, the police were called. Uh, and we were terrified, her, her mom and I, uh, and Amy, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? What's, what's, what's all, what, what did happen? What's going to happen? So they looked at the, the teller, never received the bank bag. Uh, Amy admitted that she took the bag and, she, and, she, and put it in the car and, and drove away with it. So they knew she had it, but she said she put it in the, the night deposit. The, the manager of the store, uh, you know, they, they looked at, her, at, at the manager and the manager was, was clean. So uh, it looked like all of the evidence pointed to Amy, but there was no bag. There was no money in Amy's account. There was, uh, they looked at the bank teller. They looked at everybody and they just kept waiting for money to surface or the bag to surface or some sort of evidence uh, that they could uh, 
particularly tie Amy to. And so the, the police would call every few days. Amy had to go into the police office every few days. Uh, and this dragged on for weeks. And, and it was very nerve-wracking because you want to believe your child. Uh, she was saying she put the bag in the uh, bank drop, but it, but it wasn't there. And so, uh, you know, what do you do and how do you handle that? And how do you be supportive to a child who's promising you they, they did the right thing, but gosh, all of the evidence looks so bad uh, against her. Well, after a few weeks, uh, the service department was doing maintenance on all the machines at the bank. And you know what they found? They found that there's a compartment under the, the bank uh, drawer. Uh, and when the drawer is deployed, the, the lid or, or the, the bottom of the uh, drawer uh, drops down. Well, evidently it didn't drop down this time. Amy put the bag under the drawer, the drawer closed, and then the drawer operated uh, over the next many weeks. Well, they, they, they found the bag, they opened it, all the money and, and things were in it. It was all intact, nothing was missing. Uh, so Amy was exonerated and everybody sort of scratched their head and said, oh my gosh, that's the strangest story uh, of what happened. You know, and, and faith is like that, believing in something that is almost impossible to believe in. And that's where Jesus um, takes Jairus. I mean, the news they have is your daughter is dead. How do you believe and, and still have hope when you hear that kind of news? But Jesus asks us to have faith, to believe, to live a life of hope and of faith, not of fear. Fear not. Over and over, he says to folks, don't fear. Now, salespeople will tell you that the motivation for anybody's action is based on either a fear of loss or a hope of gain, and that a good salesperson will figure out what this particular person's motivation is so they know how to tailor their sales talk. The Bible constantly asks us to live our lives focused on a hope of gain and not a fear of loss, which is, again, tragic that religion is in the top three of, of the, the companies that profit from fear because it's just the opposite of what we ought to be doing. Um, but it's easy to get folks to be afraid and, and then to, to prey on them for that. Um, and so... In Jesus' day, if you look at what he says and what he does, the stories that he tells and the things that happen around him, uh, his whole ministry is based on a hope of gain and not a fear of loss. He doesn't come and tell people to be afraid and, and turn to God. He tells them to, to look for the hope that's there. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will fall into place. That's based on a hope of gain. When he says to the disciples, come and follow me, that's also based on a hope of gain. When he tells the disciples, I'll make you fishers of men, uh, that's also based on hope. When he says, I am the light of the world, when he tells the story of the prodigal son, when he says, I am the good shepherd, all of that is based on a hope, a hope of what's to come and of what will happen if you follow and get on board. When he says, turn the other cheek, when he, says, when he feeds the 5,000, it's all based on a hope, a, a hope of God's abundance, a hope of, on God showing up, a hope on something beyond uh, what the world tells us to fear. So you get the picture. And in the Old Testament, the same kinds of stories, the story of David and Goliath is all about hope. The story of Abraham and, and his ancestors is all about hope and a promise that God is giving. The story of Gideon is a story of hope. The story of Moses leading the Israelites to the promised land is a story of hope of gain, not a fear of loss. Even though the Israelites turn it into a fear of loss, we would have been better to stay in Egypt as slaves, they said to Moses when they got cranky. You know, fear sells. It does. It does. It's, it's, it's relatively easy to get folks worked up. But Jesus is telling us not to lose uh, our lives in fear. He's telling us not to base our lives on a fear of loss. Don't let that be your motivation. Jesus invites us into a life of hope and of faith. 
Jesus invites us to, uh, as he does Jairus, uh, to continue to walk in this walk of hope. Even when we experience failure, even when we experience loss, Jesus encourages us not to give up or to give in. In one of the most powerful scenes in all of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, is the story where Cain is angry because God has uh, approved his brother Abel's offering and not Cain's offering. So Cain is angry and he's sulking and sitting off by himself. And God comes to sit beside him and talk to him and he says to Cain, Cain, why are you angry? If you do well, things will go well for you. But if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. And you've got to master that sin. You've got to master it. You've got to be able to master those emotions uh, so that you can make good choices. Well, Cain doesn't do very well with that advice. And, and he doesn't master his anger. He succumbs to it. But it's the, it's the choice that God gives us. It's the hope that God breathes into us that we would follow him out of a hope for gain and not out of a fear of loss. What's your motivation? What motivates you day by day to live and to, uh, to work, to, to be a person of faith? Is it a, is it a hope of gain or is it a fear of loss? Jesus is nudging us to a hope of gain, to believe, to hope, to trust. You know, I, I can't think of a, a, a way that uh, this idea has been more practically addressed than Mother Teresa's uh, poem, the, the poem that's attributed to Mother Teresa. Remember it with me. People are often unreasonable illogical and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you were kind, people will accuse you of being selfish or having ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight, but build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, people may be jealous, but be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. But do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. But do your best anyway. For you see, in the final analysis, it's between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Let us pray. God, we all struggle in this arena, this battle, this clash of fear and hope. We're, we're, we're challenged by that just about every situation that we have in relationships, in our work, in our private lives, in our faith, uh, to be people of hope, to expect and think the best, to continue to strive, to believe that God is working in our lives, and or to succumb to the fear that says, oh, this is terrible, this is no way, it's not going to work. God, I pray for people today that are caught in the middle of that, that are finding it so difficult to have faith, that are so wrapped up in situations that appear hopeless and, and fear is, is almost consuming them. God, I pray for courage and I pray for conviction. I pray that you'll guide them, that you'll send a, a person into their lives, you'll, uh, that this service will somehow uh, be a, a ray of hope, that, that God, that... Uh, you'll do a work in our lives, that your spirit will come in and raise us up and, and, uh, and, and God, your voice will rain down and give us hope for the day. 
Give us the hope that we need. Give us the encouragement that we need to continue to strive, continue to work, to be the people you've called us to be. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>